it is two o'clock, so we might start. If, uh, I feel like it was only yesterday that I said welcome everyone. <laughs> and I see a lot of faces, so I know, hope you have enjoyed it as much as what we have enjoyed presenting all the talks to you. Um, and so our last one, let's Leave the best to last, but I, can't, I can say that because there's no other speakers here. <laughs> so I'll just do the Library's Tasmanian Acknowledgement for the Tasmanian Aboriginal Peoples. We acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of this land. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and future who hold the memories, traditions, culture and hope of Tasmania's first peoples. Library's Tasmania also pays respects to the resilience and strength of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and extends that respect to all our First Australian peoples. And I'll, I'll hand over to Brian, and <coughs> Brian is available at the end as well if you'd like to come up and um, ask any questions. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Sandra, and um, yes, good afternoon, and, and um, thank you for all for coming on and attending us today. Um, I trust that you'll gain some small insight from the talk. Uh, and we only just noticed that the talk is advertised from 2 to 3 30, but uh, we may still be here then. You won't, I won't be talking then, but uh, <laughs> you may want to ask questions. Okay, deciphering 19th century records and documents. Yeah, to decipher, that's um, something that means to. Uh, understand or discover something that's written badly or difficult and the, and the meaning is, is hidden away. Um, it's also used to make out the meaning of poor or partially liberated writing, like uh, hastily scribbled notes, or to discover the meaning of something that's secure and difficult or hard to trace and understand. So let me begin by saying that uh, just how fortunate we are today, having an amazing collection of, of these 19th century documents and files, um, here in the library and of course at home. I just wonder what our descendants and people in the future will be able to do with what we leave them. Today we have documents and reports. Quite often we scan them, we save the images to our computer, uh, put them on the hard drive and then recycle the paper material. It's all very commendable. But as you know, with technology changing so quickly, Will our saved documents, like all these here, still exist as electronic files in five or ten years' time? Certainly things will have changed so much in years to come as they have in not the distant past. I very much doubt that anything we save on our computer today will still exist or still be available or readable in 50 years' time, not that I'll be here. Okay. So how many of us still have on our computer a device that will read a floppy disk? Can you open a file saved in Word 5 or any earlier versions of Microsoft Word? With the advent of the current new laptops and solid state hard drives, most computers today come with virtually no moving parts except for perhaps a keyboard. Not many years ago, you had to save your files onto a DVD for storage. Many laptops now do not even have a DVD drive. Mine certainly doesn't. Yes, USB flash drives are the interesting standard at the moment. And then there is the mysterious cloud up there, somewhere in some far off country, over which you have little control now or in the future. So who knows just what will be utilised in this ever-changing electronic world. I really think it is something to really think about just how we are preserving the documentation of our past and current lives for our future generations. Okay, enough of the future. We're here to talk about the past today. By the end of today's session, I hope you will have some small understanding of the use of abbreviations and the way some documents, especially the comic records, were laid out and written. But I must say that quite often to decipher and transcribe certain 19th century documents, it may take considerable time and even an enormous amount of effort, patience, persistence, tolerance and endurance but the end result, of course, can personally be quite satisfying and worthwhile. You all will have some understanding of words used in documents which were written in the 19th century here in Tasmania, and some from overseas, and of course, 
that words abbreviations, sayings and phrases in most instances have not generally changed a lot. But I will show you examples of correspondence files from the convict department, mean names and letters, as well as some private letters and some difficult documents, including wills. Actually, deciphering a document can be quite exciting. To be able to determine the meaning of something that looks quite obscure or is illegible, and to, to transcribe that detail from a document into a word file or whatever, with lots of abbreviations like conduct records, is a really fulfilling task, something I love. Decoding the meaning and translating the message contained in, into ordinary understandable language will be somewhat time consuming, as I said, but the end result can quite often give you a complete insight into what happened and what was going on at the time with your ancestor or the person whom you were researching. The incredible library in which we are situated today and the work which has been done digitising a staggering amount of records concerning our island's history is truly mind-blowing. It is now possible to go into the library's website and type in a name like John Smith here and come up with an incredible number of records. This John, or old John's had something like 4,300 records. I'm pleased that I'm not a descendant from a John Smith. In amongst these records that are transcribed these days and digitised and online, we have births, marriages, deaths, burials, convict and prison records, census, bankruptcy, divorces, health and welfare, health and welfare, sorry, inquests and wills. The list goes on and on, and it is currently being constantly updated. Not that many years ago, if you were doing family history research, it took an amazing amount of time, far more than today, as you had to come into the library patiently search through microfilms and, where possible, unindexed manuscripts and books. Today, so much has been digitised and it is online, and great credit is due to the exceptional staff here at Library Tasmania. Mm -hmm. Now, many of you possibly have discovered that you have convict ancestors or records of close relations, which, as I said, are online. You can download a record and save it to your computer, but then try to understand it. Uh -huh and see what it actually says, that can be a bit daunting. <coughs> Especially with the sample I have on the screen at the moment, the records were written up by a convict writer at the time. The information in the records came quite often from a parchment document, sometimes referred to as a police record. You may know about these. These parchment documents were sent with the convict. He's as he or she was moved around the island, and such details of offences and sentences were recorded on that document. Eventually, the parchment was returned to the convict department and the details transferred into the convict record books as we now know them today. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these parchment documents were deliberately destroyed in the fire in the 1960s. I'll later show one that survived, hopefully. Now, these convict writers in other words, convicts who could read it quite well, were used to write up these convict records. But they, to save time and space, they began using abbreviations and acronyms to save this valuable space and time, much the same as people do today using texting on their mobile phones. Not the idea of a cup, bear texting. I mean, like, texting is okay, but complete words, no abbreviations. <laughs> Fortunately, there are are groups of dedicated volunteers working every day in transcribing and creating data from these convict records. Founders and survivors have been working exceptionally hard to transcribe all convict records, especially the male convict records, but they may not always include all the details from the records. Similarly, the female convict research group have done an amazing job in transcribing female convict records. You can go onto their website join up and log into the database and you'll be amazed at the way every detail of the convicts are accessible and cross-indexed, with lots of volunteer overseas researchers adding details and records from the United Kingdom and elsewhere. But often you may want to ex have the experience of actually transcribing the record yourself to see what the original record, just how it was written, and to write it all down to get the feeling of what actually was recorded about your ancestor. 
So today I'll go through and just try to give you some understanding of how the records are laid out and written, and especially the abbreviations and the sayings, phrases used. This may give you some insight and hopefully may assist you, especially if you are transcribing your own convict's records or other records and documents. Naturally, there are some very useful books which are available in our libraries, normally in the family history section, of course. These are a great help with understanding abbreviations, etc., as you try to transcribe these convict records. First word, one there is one that uh, Marie Ring did some time ago. It's called abbreviations and acronyms for Tasmanian genealogists. It's, it's quite a good one. The second one is abbreviations used in convict records of Van Diemen's Land of New South Wales, compiled by the descendants of convict groups in Victoria. But what is probably the most comprehensive publication is Transcribing Tasmanian Convict Records. This was written by Sue Hood uh, some time ago and published by the Port Arthur Historic Site Management Authority. The book is available in the family history area in most libraries in the state. Perhaps you should have a copy of the home. But Sue has recently updated the book and they decided instead of printing lots of copies, it's going to be free online, which would be brilliant when it gets there. But already there is on the Port Arthur website a downloadable PDF of 12 pages listing useful convict record abbreviations. Some of them, as you see here, uh, ABCD absconded, ADMO. ND admonished, uh, ADL PD proved, and so on. And those of you can see them probably not see them probably down the back, but um, uh, R and W means that the convict could read and write. Um, C H uh, was chain gang usually, and C of court martial. And of course, well, this one, but we won't go through all twelve pages today. But it's there. Oh. Um, it's actually listed on their uh, Port Arthur website um, under educational resources, riddles and rubbish, which is a strange way of putting it, <laughs> and then it's called trans transcription help notes, but it's easy to download as a PDF. Last year, Simon Barnover reproduced a fascinating 200 year old dictionary of criminal slang and other impolite terms used by convicts. Simon's book contains some 760 entries, which give a remarkable insight into the meaning of these old clinic sling terms. The original vocabulary of flash language was an immense bestseller, or immediate bestseller, 200 years ago for the colonial administrators. It, found, uh, it was found to be an indispensable reference manual for magistrates, government officials, and court people. It enabled them to analyse, understand, and rationalise just what was being uttered before them in the lockups and jails in both New South Wales and Tasmania. Simon has added many simple illustrations, describes just where the slang terms were used in New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land, and you may find these slang terms of great interest in your research. Of course, today on the internet, there are an incredible number of resources to help you with your deciphering. This one is from the Family Search website and could be of assistance when examining old English documents, as I'll come to later, especially in wills. We're normally familiar with the use of Roman numerals and dates, etc., but I recently received this reference to very early French versions of Roman numerals, which, for some reason, the French can be difficult, hopefully it's not a French um, uh, which use the letters I and J for the numeral 1. And this is very confusing at first sight. But we may need to move on, but that one is interesting if you ever see dates with I's and J's in them. So let's start today with very early male convict records in the library's collection. They are listed as Con 31. They are from the assignment period which operated until 1840. I'll be using samples from some of my own research. That is, people on whom I've carried out a little bit of work myself. And I have to say, in giving these examples, there are words and sections in these records and documents that even I, says me, do not fully understand and cannot decipher, so you have to bear with me. If there are any instances where you see that I have made mistakes, then certainly uh, you may interject today and make uh, suggestions and corrections. 
Uh, if I can't transcribe something and you think you know the answer, then please, I'll not be offended, just put out where I'm wrong. <laughs> we'll see. All right. First up here, George Paley, this is his Con 31 record. As you probably noticed, there were four individual records on each page. That's why I've cropped the others out. Now, George was not the best of people, but we're not here today to intimately discuss individual case histories, merely to see how the records were written up. As you may see, in those early days, the book was turned on its side, and at first, on the left-hand side there, using red ink, early details were written, usually about why the convicts transported, and some family details as well. As the convict later committed offences or misdemeanors in the state, these were then written in black ink across and followed down the page, sometimes completely obscuring the any details. <laughs> Dates and details of when the convict appeared in local Supreme Court appearances were crammed at the left-hand margin of the records. You can see right there. Well, let's see if we can decipher what was just written in the red ink. George was transported for burglary. The next line states in his US, or sorry, his UK jail report, abbreviated REPT, he was supposedly a bad character, but then it adds orderly. The next line is his help report on his way to transportation. Again, he was orderly. The next line, he confessed, not, normally that had the crime that he committed and what he confessed to, but it only appears to have any mother akin to it. The next line is also confusing. It says, parents at Bristol were kids with his, anyway, uh, and it looks like married to a widow. Um, so that one's, I'm not really sure about that, but as you see, it's really difficult, they are really difficult to, to read. So let's now yeah, go back to his actual record. Right at the top, you'll see the page number. Uh, beneath that, TL2.7.40, which means he received his ticket of leave on the 2nd of July, 1840. On the left is what is commonly called his police number, so, uh, which did relate to his uh, police record. This numbering system did change over time. Sometimes it was given to the convicts on the ship and on their, or on their arrival, and later each convict was given, given a numerical running number as they arrived, which was handy for finding them later. Under his name is recorded that he was transported in the Lord Hungerford. The two in brackets signifying it was the second voyage of this ship, transport ship, bearing convicts. He was tried in Gloucester on the 4th of April 1821 and received a life sentence. Some of the, of the other abbreviations of this record, um, down there, I'm not sure what this is in the right spot, I think it might have the page in the wrong Yes, all right, we'll come back to that. Um, but uh, as with most convict records, with these offences, the date of the offence is usually underlined. You can see the dates underlined there. Then each new offence or misdemeanor is easy to identify as you go through. Then following the date is sometimes his or her status, like having a ticket of leave, sometimes it's who the convict worked for, sometimes where he or she was stationed. Then the crime or misdemeanor is listed and then occasionally separated by only maybe a comma if the sentence that is, that, and that um, gives you a break to the sentence that he received at the end. Following in brackets, usually, or slashes, are the initials of the magistrates or justices whom the convict appeared before in court. They heard the offence, interviewed witnesses, and where required, imposed a sentence. So right up at the top there, George's first recorded offence was that on the 25th of April, 1823, he was charged with conspiring to kill his master, rob his house and steal his property. Sounds pretty grim. Obviously the magistrates before whom George appeared, the initials there, RKK, that's Robert Lockwood, Reverend Robert Lockwood, and then AWHH, held the lawyer William Henry Humphrey, along with GFR, George Frederick Reed, they were not satisfied with the evidence and acquitted George. We don't know why exactly. But I can go on with George's other offences, but the time, time really is limited. So, you might want to know all the time reading through these records who the magistrates were. Often it's listed, listed as CPM, which means, means Chief Police Magistrate, 
Sometimes I hate the end the acting or police magistrate, otherwise it's usually justice of the peace listed by their initials. And for a great list of these police magistrates or JPs, you need to return to that female convict research group website. And under the convict system page, you'll find a comprehensive list of magistrates indexed by the names. It's a brilliant bit of work done by the female convict research group. Magistrates all the way right through the whole convict system. Um, now, probably George, if you've noticed straight away, eventually George was executed mm -hmm. down the bottom page there. But nowhere does it mention the crime for which he was executed. I'll come back to that in a minute. But beside it, it says SV N2, page 36. So this is a, a reference to book two, a continuation of records where the original book was page was full because of George saying so many things. <laughs> now, it's called in the library here, Con 32. Now, there's no need to go through all of uh, George's offences. The first offence listed was being in a chain gang. Quite often, this was simply recorded as PW and HW, meaning public works and hard labour. Although not all public work gangs were in leg irons or chain gangs. But um, his first offence, if you can read it up there, he stole a bag of straw, uh, had his had that in his possession. He was at, uh, it was dismissed through lack of evidence. Um, further on down there, he made away with some soap, uh, which sounds good, he wanted to keep himself clean probably, uh, but it was the property of the Crown, and for that he got three months hard labour in the chain gang. So on, so yes, some of the things could be quite difficult when you're a convict. The assignment list is another lot of records uh, and as transported, and usually uh, this, I think, we came from the particular ships themselves. George Height uh, in this uh, column 13 was listed as 5 foot 2. Uh, his complexion was dark, he was aged 22, and he was a farmer's labour in Plowman. His transportation details are also listed, uh, as was his name, place which actually says Wills, whatever Wills meant. Because from memory, he came from some small town, with something else, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't Wills. Uh, quite often, people. The convicts told the writers what they wanted to tell them. Um, it doesn't mean they're always accurate. Um, and uh, he did, the only marks he had was a scar over his right eyebrow. So why was George executed? So just in case you're interested in that, to find that out, we have to go to some other records. And these records here are online now, but they're all listed under what's called SC32, Supreme Court records. C32. They are all online as I said, and they detail minutes of the proceedings in criminal cases from the Supreme Court. George was charged before Justice Godzina on Montague on the 20th of December 1841 with being an accessory to the murder of Thomas Lord. Thomas Lord was murdered by James Williamson. Both of them pleaded not guilty, but they were found guilty. Now, here's a sketch of, of George as he appeared in the court that day. The newspaper actually, newspaper reporter actually sketched him, which was interesting. But that's enough. Uh, a week later, the prisoners reappeared in the Supreme Court and they were sentenced to be hanged and afterwards dissected, as you saw on this record. On his record, sorry. But, so, so yes. Uh, George was executed at uh, Murray Street Jail in uh, January 40, 1842. But it's about time we moved on from George to a later convict layer, which is uh, <coughs> convict. Because the book got quite full, they changed the layout slightly. Um, and only had three, sometimes two convicts per page. So this is a, uh, a, a block of the, the page with the three convicts on it, but um, we'll go to the top one here. Uh, James Thomas. Overall, the details were similar, except that the convicts' transportation details are now written in red ink at the top, as you can see, at the top right-hand side. Uh, details, the dates, offences, the sentences, and the magistrate details are all recorded the same as before. But it's not easy to distinguish all the details, because um, this one is, is quite uh, um, scrawled, really. Uh, the, um, 
a copy from the archives of all Jewish history. The archives is not that clear. But um, so uh, just quickly, James um, Thomas was a tailor, and um, after being uh, first assigned to his what cut to a minute, uh, he ended up being assigned a couple of houses a tailor to uh, the great Sir John Franklin. But uh, uh, James had a, a drink problem, uh, so he was soon dismissed from that, and uh, basically drink became his uh, downfall all the way through. Um, so his other uh, problems there are yeah, mostly are uh, uh, through drink and scrawny occasionally. But uh, James did marry and uh, worked for tailors around Hogarth time. He, uh, he had a large family, uh, actually married three times. Uh, outlived his, his first two wives died uh, quite young. Um, and I'll mention James again a bit later on. He uh, does come into my story. Uh, and first, as I've mentioned before, uh, Con 27 is another record book. Uh, it's, it's well written up and it lists who the, uh, uh, the convicts were assigned to uh, in those early days. As I said, James was a, uh, a tailor uh, and a, what was called a cutting out expert, which meant he was uh, used to doing the cutting work for the tailors. Uh, he was assigned, first of all, to Mr. Chen for a couple of months before going to the government house. If you haven't come across them before, they're description records and they only appear separately for the first, um, the 1840, for the uh, assignment period of convicts. Um, so here's uh, James's um, Con 18 record, as you can probably read it better than I can at the moment. Um, it just details his height, his, uh, the fact that he came from Knightsbridge. Um, Hair was light brown, so a few abbreviations there. LT for light, uh, ML for medium large nose, um, and medium large chin. Um, he didn't have a beard at all. Then down the bottom, uh, in the remarks, um, he was pocketed, which meant he, as a child, or when he was younger, he had uh, smallpox. Um, a lot of them you'll see mark that put that down as remarks because it, it is something that you pick up very quickly. Uh, Eliza Gear had no idea, maybe it was his girlfriend back in um, England. Uh, and then uh, the marks on his arms, uh, just initials, um, uh, a heart and darts uh, with two glasses, and a jug above his elbow on his left arm, and anchor and cable uh, below his elbow on his right arm. Yeah, tattoos, if you have. Come across tattoos and you're interested in that. Again, um, Simon Barnard's uh, uh, book of. Um, Another one of his great books uh, is all about convict tattoos. Um, he details uh, a great number of, of the convicts and uh, with his brilliant drawings and sketches and, and lists the, uh, the uh, tattoos and a lot of description about what, what the convict, what the tattoos mean and uh, how they were done. Um, of course, Simon, if you haven't uh, looked at his book, A to Z of Convicts, it's a book that uh, uh, anyone doing family history in Tasmania should uh, have uh, a look at because it does have some brilliant drawings of, um, of how the convicts were treated, housed and uh, lived in Van Diemen's Land. Okay, moving on though, we have to move on from the probation, or to the probation era from the early 1840s. These records come under Con 33 and they list each convict per page. They contain all the necessary information previously spread out over several pages of convict details in various books. Again, I've chosen Alan Matthew Williamson, almost as an old friend who I've researched over many years. Because of his multiple reoffending, Alan was the second last of the approximately 74,000 convicts sent here to Van Diemen's Land and he was still funded under the imperial convict system. He died in 1893, just some eight months before the last long-serving convict, Mark Jeffrey. There was only two convicts towards the end that were being still funded from England. So let me quickly explain how Allen's record is detailed as a con 33. He was tried in the uh, Norwich Assizes on the 21st of July 1847. He arrived in Hobart Town on the second voyage of the convict transport Mariah Soames. He was a Protestant, and he trained as a land surveyor 
and a bit of farming, I think, as well. Um, and uh, he could read and write remarkably well, which would be to his advantage and also his undoing for the rest of his life. We'll come to that. Nell was transported for obtaining money by a forged letter, an offence he regularly recommitted here. Mm -hmm. He was single, and you should be able to read all his description details. But, uh, yeah, if you can't see them all there, he was five foot five tall, uh, he had brown hair, red whiskers, brown eyebrows and eyes, medium chin, uh, his name placed was Aberdeen, and he had a, scan, a scar sorry, on the forefinger of his left hand. But it was not long before some of his illegal... Oh, sorry. Should have been um, Because of his writing skills, Alan was immediately given a ticket of leave, which is a little bit unusual at the time to just arrive and be given a ticket of leave. Um, but he was employed at the Campbell Street Prisoners Barracks as a writer, mainly dealing with official correspondence. But it was not too long before some of his illegal activities with his writing were discovered and he was sent to Impression Bay Probation Station for six months hard labour with his ticket of leave revoked. Again, we do not need to follow his every transgression of forgery and obtaining money of goods which went on previous to take of life here. But on the right hand side of his record, under the headings of remarks, we can see listed every date of his movements, backwards and forwards, from the prisoners' barracks, listed as PB, of course, that's one thing to note. You see PB in your records, prisoners' barracks, Campbell Street. And he went to I Bay. Now, you can think where's I Bay? It's Impression Bay um, at, uh, on Tasman Peninsula. Uh, he also went to Launceston, Longford, uh, and is listed at Lake Town, the men he worked for. This remarks column is a valuable resource in tracing just who, when, and who your convict worked for and where he was living. On the left hand edge of most records are the official notes, again recording the actual dates the convict was at a particular station or office. These can be quite difficult to, to read and understand, but if you can try to transcribe them, you can get some idea cross-referencing with, the, with his offences, just where he was at a particular time. Down at the bottom of, of Alan's record, scrawled is see next page. And of course, because of his offences, Alan, uh, Alan's record took more than one page. Uh, in fact, it took several pages. But he lived in Tasmania for here for 43 years, almost every day of that he was in incarceration in jail. Alan, there he is. He died in his cell in Campbell Street Jail the day after arriving by train from Launceston to serve yet another 10 year sentence for forgery. He said to the, the warders, you won't see me tomorrow. I'm not going to be here. And they said, but you're not going to escape. And he said, no, I'm not going to be here. He thought he was. But he just died of old age. That's beautiful. Besides his reoffending, Alan appears on page 21 of a jail prisoner's record book. Now, jail prisoners record books are brilliant. They come under GD63. Uh, and this uh, particular book is the first one of the series, but it's listed as 63-2-1. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the layout's the same as used for COM33 with a few handwritten alterations. Basically, the book was, a, I suppose, a book to, to be used by COM33 eventually, but it wasn't. And I mentioned very early that convicts carried or had sent with them a parchment police record, which was sent, taken to the, all the stations, new things written in there, and then sent back with them. And this is Ellen's. It's one of very few, possibly a hundred or so, out of 70,000 that survived. The parchment was started on his arrival, but travelled with him as he was sent around the state. They recorded his many offences and sentences before it regularly came back to Hobart with him, where all the details were then carefully transferred to his page in the Com 33 record book. The parchment's years of travel and toil are quite visible, but it's remarkable that it still exists. And I worry about doing this, but... Uh, there it is. It's one of the few police records that still exist. It was saved from the fire at Campbell Street Jail 
dyed water, uh, and eventually it's going to the archives here. Um, right. Uh, the photograph, is that usual? Um, the photograph was uh, not, uh, when he was uh, later on in jail, uh, around the uh, uh, 1880s, Roughly, they were photographing prisoners. They did photograph convicts at Port Arthur in the, from the 1870s, 1880s, roughly, uh, and they photographed prisoners in jail. So that, that photo dates from that time. Uh, but it was attached to his uh, police record, which um, was still being <coughs> used uh, even as he was a prisoner in jail. Um, and there are other uh, photos, jail photos, as you saw on the uh, uh, previously. Um, it's the same photo because they, uh, they were taken glass by niggers and they, they printed off um, lots of copies which were then, uh, I think, worked out sometimes, something like 13 copies of the, of the photographs. Most of them have disappeared, of course. But um, now the, the parchment records that uh, were taken about are really, uh, as I said, they were, they, sorry, they, they didn't need them. Um, and when they were cleaning up Campbell Street Chart, we thought they moved to Bristol. So, the order was given? No. Nah. But luckily some waters create proper force of things. And, and, uh, so and there's a, 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 in uh, I think Mitchell Library there's a box there with um, yeah, maybe 70 or 80 of these hundred records, but that's that's the biggest collection we know of here. Yeah. Should be here in Tasmania, but Mitchell Library is not mm -hmm. yes, I don't like the things Okay. Um, so where are we up to? Oh, yeah, well, there's, there's, sorry, there's his, um, there's his photo attached to the record, a, a copy of it. Um, so it was attached to uh, as it was, was, as I said, it was still being used in his jail times. Um, now, moving on. Uh, uh, I've concentrated on the male convict record. So here's a sample of a female convict record from Sarah Sifton. The assignment era female contact records were listed as con 40 up until 1835. They used the same layer of abbreviations as the male contact records. Um, just a, a quick one here, you may, if you can read it, it's interesting to notice in the scroll from 1843 that Sarah was listed uh, there as UX Green. Now, UX was an abbreviation for the Latin word uxor, meaning wife. So Sarah had married Samuel Green and presumably from this offence, he charged it with and had it locked up for misconduct as she was keeping a disorderly house. But uh, in UX is not, um, it's really saying that he's on some final some records. And in the probation era, records, records for the female the prisoners on the common 41 was used, used the same way as the same way of convict records. Description was the same. Um, and uh, that's listed as CON 19 for the female prisoners. As you'll notice, the, uh, the fact that uh, whiskers is crossed out because not too many of the female convicts have whiskers. Okay. Yeah, moving on to jail records, we're certainly fortunate that the vast majority of Tasmanian jail records still exist and have been digitised. They're easy to read in the convict records, although they do have certain abbreviations. Many of them, of course, carry quite high resolution photos of prisoners, which can be a great benefit to edge to your family history. This uh, photo of, of James here was, I think, 1911, those photographs were taken. But uh, again, glass plate negatives um, and uh, brilliantly done. Uh, yeah, I have to quickly say that, that uh, James Mitchell was not his real name, his real name was James Thomas. Uh, and uh, you might be surprised to find he was the, actually the adopted son of the previous James Thomas, whose record we saw earlier. Um, and uh, but this James was born in Hobart, 1839, uh, joined the Royal Navy uh, in his 20s uh, before deserting in Sydney and fleeing to Melbourne in the late 1860s. He then spent the next 30 years of his life in and out of jails in Victoria, Tasmania, um, before dying at the age of 94 in Norfolk. Middle Hospital. Uh, but uh, yes, James is quite a character. He actually dictated his life story, which is uh, in a book these days. Mm -hmm. um, if you 
can access them, which is very difficult. The New South Wales prisoner records uh, are quite um, are quite okay. It carry photographs as, as well, but um, they can be uh, like this one a bit scrawly. Now, Victorian jail records are available online as PDFs via the Public Records Office of Victoria. They usually take up a large page and are very detailed, quite often with multiple photos. This was being called Tommy the Nut for some reason. Um, but a second photo of him there is taken a lot early, so that it's the times that they are in and out of jail are usually quite often re-photographed. Um, James Mitchell, as I saw it before, has he was photographed something like seven or eight times in old jail, which is fantastic to see how he changed over the years. Um, but they do, uh, the Victorian records occasionally uh, do have abbreviations like IMD for indulgences, SC, which is uh, solitary confinement, same as here, uh, VJ for visiting justice, and um, uh, so on. But we've got to move on. Documents and letters. In 1838, John Fitzgerald received this handwritten colonial remission or pardon. This is his pardon certificate. It was signed by John Franklin, but it is handwritten. And note that John's comic description. The pen was written in red ink uh, across the certificate. It's quite difficult to decipher. But as I have emphasised, gaining the ability to read, decipher, and transcribe early documents like these is basically a learning process which takes considerable time, concentration, effort and practice. Fortunately, from around 1847, in the year of Lieutenant Governor William Denison, conditional pardons were neatly laid out and printed, making them much easier to read, as in this 1853 card for George Dickner. We won't go into any more of the details on it, but again, he's got his details written down the site, but they're easy to read. And the efficiency of the system continued. This 1858 Certificate of Freedom to Convict William Chain dictates that, as you can probably read it this better than I can, this is to certify that on the examination of the assignment of this, it appears that William Chain, who was tried and whatever, uh, under sentence of transportation for 10 years, uh, has duly served the period for which he has been transported and is henceforth restored to freedom. But yes, if you can find certificates like that, you're very lucky. And the certificate was signed on behalf of the government by William Nairn, the acting controller general of the Commons. Similarly, in 1859, William Nairn, now the sheriff of Van Diemen's Land, had his deputy sign his warrant for the release, release of prisoner Frederick Ackerman. However, some documents are particularly large in physical size, and an incredible number of words, and written in legalese, making them extremely difficult to transcribe and un understand. I won't even start with this one, but because we'd be here for hours. But um, it's something that you have to go through basically word by word, we'll come to that. All right, enough of the official correspondence and documents. Uh, now here's some early letters, memos, wills, and other documents to give you an idea of the difficulties which you've experienced in trying to decipher such handwritten material. The task can be, as I said at the beginning, solved by lots of patience, persistence, tolerance, endurance, taking an enormous amount of time. We may need, as I just said, to write down each word as it is written on a line, leaving spaces or question marks when you can't understand particular words. Then by going back to the beginning, repeatedly examining the document, filling in more words as you grasp the meaning of each sentence, and hopefully you'll find a complete transcription. Now what you mentioned with Nian, as I mentioned, had possibly the worst scrawl of any of the officers of the colonial government. I doubt whether anyone there can understand what it says, maybe. All right. Enough? This is what it says. And as you see, uh, it was written, scrawled by Nian and sent out to uh, all these different places. There it is again. So, yes, try to transcribe that. So, uh, does take a little bit of work. Uh, but uh, presumably his um, underlings and the, uh, the people at the various stations could understand his writing at, at the time. And it's one thing, I have to say, we did uh, a lot of transcription of Port Arthur documents. And uh, Nairn's scroll, after a while, you, you can you can basically read it if you. As soon as you work out what he's talking about, it's quite easy to tell what he's written. 
but it didn't know he was. As with texting, the letters are quickly written with the writer knowing exactly what he was on about, but sometimes we're left pondering. Thus, as this directive by the superintendent of Richmond in 1834 states to whoever he's writing, Sir, then buy no such articles as the Crabwich and metal blocks in the Ordnance Magazine. I have to report that the Ordnance doorkeeper may be authorised to purchase them. And I have the honour to be, Sir, your obedient servant, and so on. Um, but you could all read that anyway. And like this one here, this is the top part written by John the Archer, who was the colonial architect, and could write reasonably well. But he um, he then got convicts, um, sometimes they were, the letters were dictated to them. As and and sometimes it's written here like that. And they were also done in multiple copies, which were routinely sent and passed around in various departments. And of course, the letter came back with replies scrawled across the rear of the page. Um, and uh, depending on who was writing it, uh, again, it's hard to transcribe. And you can even get them like this. Um, so, um, yes, you have to start again, um, just reading each little bit of time, word by word, and trying to work out which bit refers to whatever. Uh, it can be very, very difficult uh, without it's almost impossible at times without a very minute examination. But if you're fortunate enough, and it, it's quite possible that you may have uh, letters written between families, hopefully. And this slightly acrimonious letter is written by one sister to another after the death of their father. The girl obviously was not well educated, but she could write. And many of the words are spelt phonetically. But it's quite easy to read and understand just what she's saying. You just need to ignore the spelling and read it out aloud, as it would be pronounced. So it starts off, the year 1897, my dear sister, I write to you this short note to let you know that I am not coming to you, so don't ask me any more to come, for I am not. And it goes on, but it, it is, it's quite often they, uh, they write phonetically. Yes. Uh, this letter tells of an unrequited love or a one-sided love affair that's uh, probably not openly reciprocated. The beloved may not have even been aware of the deep and strong romantic affection, but whether the letter was actually sent, I'm not sure. We came across that one quite interestingly. Now, in researching your family history, you may need to decipher early church documents and records from both Tasmania and overseas. Most local documents are relatively easy to transcribe, but some, especially Irish, Baptismal records are confusing until you understand just what they contain and how they're done. It's like this. It does appear very confusing, but this Irish baptism register is quite straightforward with the date of the baptism listed first, the child's given name, and then using of for the father's name and the mother's maiden name. That gets some idea who the parents were, and then underneath the godparents are even listed. Sometimes the minister's name or initials are included, and occasionally the fact that the child was illegitimate is added. But yes, once you start to get through them, and if you can blow them up that big, it's not too bad. This handwritten letter regarding baptism and early death of a child is another sample from a family history inquiry from Ireland. But it is, that is quite uh, good, and it was written much later, of course. Early English wills were written with quite an unusual writing font and often with legal definitions. This one is difficult to read and it's spelt phonetically again. It was a second will replacing one previously written. You can read that image. That's what it says. As you see, the, uh, the transcription is, is how it's actually written, but uh, uh, you can read it there in my last will, which is uh, go to bed. Uh, who was a lawyer, I have left my oldest son £1,000, but having altered my mind, mind, I shall only leave £500, 5% 5 annuities, and so on, it goes on and on. Now, another early French ancestor of mine wrote her will in her native language, French of course. After her death in, in 1747, it was translated by a lawyer into English. It was relatively easy to describe, except for one word, which I had no idea just what it was. And this is one I worked on for a long time. So, in the middle there, 
it said, I make for something of all my goods. And it wasn't until I went back to the uh, uh, to other wills written by the same time, um, by the same lawyer, of course, and that I realised what the word was. And it was Harris. So how, yes. <laughs> So he was, she was making her daughter her heiress of all the worldly goods. But that's to show you that sometimes can be the truth. You can work word, it's really almost impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to work with it. It took me years before I eventually worked out what that was. Once you work, realise that it's dead simple. <laughs> and my great grandmother's will is in plain English, but it also took considerable time to decipher. Some of the words and spellings were written. Yeah. Uh, to finish up, I'd like to show you just some words and meanings to somebody transcribing some Port Arthur correspondence stuff. So, years ago, as I said, we did uh, uh, all the, uh, the transcription, all the uh, uh, correspondence files between Port Arthur and, and England, actually. Uh, most of the words are still used today, but some are a bit obscure. We've got to show this. Yeah, I've actually got these online if, if, you, if anyone wants to know they go to my website. But, uh, uh, let me know if I go through them too fast. And some of them are quite beautiful words. But, and some of them are, are convict terms, uh, slang terms, but others are just uh, words that are not um, used that much. But, uh, I like nullity, useless opposites. That's written by a convict, obviously. It's something we wouldn't use today. Peas. Plural of peas. It's not something we use. But yeah. I should mention one over there, singing by a place they call repute where prostitutes are waiting their call. It's not something that's used to them, that I know. And no, slam for no. town, no. convict slam for being set from hope and from Port Arthur up to Hobart. Yeah. 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 And finally, just um, abbreviation of first names. You'll quite often see names abbreviated like that. That's just a, a shortness, really. Um, but it is quite handy to, uh, to get some idea. All right.